Oh, okay. Thanks. We're going. Thanks. Sure.
Hey, Joe. Hello. How are you? Doing well. Okay, good. So um, I just wanted to test my feature quickly. So, oh, um, can you, sorry, can you spotlight me? Sure. Thank you. Is this it? Oh, okay, great. Yep. Thanks. Let's see. Okay, seems to be working, yeah? Yep, I see the Zoom. Yep. Okay, great. All right, good, good, good. And then I wanna test the sound a little bit. How's the sound, good? Sounds great. Okay, great. Well, okay. <laughs> All right. So I think we're about ready. Okay. So I'll be right back with everybody in just a few minutes. Thank you so much for joining me. Yay for Sutro. Okay, Joe, see you in a bit. See you soon.
Hey there, I'm John. And tonight we're headed up Mount Sutro on my bike. Now, as you remember, back during the beginning or near the beginning of COVID-19, we ventured to the top of my hill and we discovered a whole bunch of celebrities. Then a number of weeks later, we ventured off into the Fillmore district and learned all about how the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency destroyed communities. Then we ventured to the top of Lone Mountain and we claimed it for queerdom. We planted a gay flag and made it a gay mountain. And all along the way, we discovered walks of death. Tonight, we'll discover great architecture, great music, some great drugs, and we'll learn about some really horrible, horrible crimes as we venture up the slopes of Mount Sutro. We'll find it all on the slopes of the great Mount Sutro. So let's get started. Now, first of all, this hat, cute, right? But no good. Yeah, it's not gonna protect me. I need to put on my protection. So we begin with, yes, indeed, the COVID-19 mask. COVID-19 is still out there, right? Yep, we don't wanna give it to anybody and we certainly don't wanna get it. Now we have to put on our bicycle helmet. Remember my friend's mother? She used to say, aren't you guys nice? You're going out to ride your bikes without a helmet. That's great because when you get in an accident, you're gonna be donating your organs to science. You're so generous, how generous of you. Think of all those people who are waiting for a new liver or a new kidney. You're gonna give your kidney to them. That's so thoughtful of you. Now, we have to put on our COVID-19 Zoom gloves. These are special gloves that I designed myself because they're missing fingers. That's right, they help us manipulate the Zoom camera on Zoom. Then, our backpack. Now the backpack's very important because it's got our glasses in it. Yep, it's also got our wallet. Our wallet has our insurance card in it. Now, if, God forbid, I'm in an accident, the first thing the paramedics are gonna do is a wallet biopsy. They're gonna be looking for my health card. And my husband is giving me very fancy health insurance. So I'm gonna find my health card because I want the best treatment. Now, let's put on a headset. This is where I'll be able to talk to you. So let's unplug. There we go. And now we're going to plug in the headset. Ha! Now we're plugged into the phone. Okay, I think we're all set. So let's get started. I'm going to take you guys off the wall. That's right. And I'm going to move you over here to where my bike is parked. And I'm going to put you onto my bicycle. So you'll be right there with me going on the bike ride. How about that? Now let's turn on our headlight for safety. Oh, it's a bright one, isn't it? And our rear light, so the cars can see us. Can you see it blinking in my hand? Well, it's there and it's red. Let's test one thing. Gorgeous. And now we're ready. We're ready to venture out into the night, into the wilds of San Francisco during COVID-19. How exciting is that? Here we go. Okay, we're going to leave the apartment. Brace yourselves. This should be good and exciting. We are now out in the hallway of our building, and I'm going to lock the door. Now, I always say I lock the door because I've got a terrific husband. Michael's been my husband forever. I just love him, and I hate for somebody somebody to break in while I'm gone and take him somewhere. That'd be awful. Also, he's kind of like a cat. He might go out a cat door or something and get lost. So now he's locked in. Nobody can get at him and he can't escape like a cat. I'm so excited. Good night, Michael. This is our building. We've lived in this building since we moved in in September, 1987. And here we go out on the Central Avenue. It was once the center of the city. Now our first stop, is gonna be a building right across the street. Hey there. Take care. 
Across the street is a halfway house full of some delightful people. Now, what they do is they have karaoke sessions in the halfway house. Isn't that fun? They sing right in the window so that you can hear them. There you go. And they sing some of my favorite songs. One of my favorites that they sing is a Neil Diamond song called September Morn. I just love it because it reminds me about the day that we moved in here, a September morning. I'm a sucker for those people. In high school, I hate, I loved all the wrong music. Neil Diamond, and Murray, Kenny Rogers. So off we go on our journey. And let's start the journey with Neil Simon and September Morn. September morn, we danced until the night became a brand new day. Two lovers playing scenes from some romantic play. September morning still can make me feel that way. You see, I never fit in. Kenny Rogers, Neil Diamond, Ann Murray. I even loved the Bee Gees. I even loved Air Supply and musicals. I wasn't like anybody. I also had my own opinions about who the best Einstein was. In my household, it was all about Albert Einstein, but I like Daniel Einstein. He's the architect of these fantastic buildings across the street. Look at them, like soldiers wearing their fancy uniforms, marching down Central. Isn't that impressive? The architecture of Daniel Einstein from the year 1899. How fun is that? So let's head on down. Central. Now, as I say, I never fit in. In a lot of ways, I didn't know where I was headed. I was lonely a lot of the time. I didn't know what I wanted in another person. It certainly wasn't anything that I was taught about in school or saw in movies. Fortunately, I found Michael. I met him in college. And we moved in together. Back in 1987, that's how you got married. You just moved in. There was no legal way for gay people to get married. So you just moved into an apartment together and you call that a marriage. And here we are on Page Street and we're facing a building that they say might have been designed by Edgar Matthews, although they're not sure, from 1900. It's a perfect craftsman structure. We'll see a lot of craftsman buildings tonight. Arts and crafts architecture is defined by redwood shingles, red windows, and green window frames. Isn't that lovely? From 1900. So now we're headed onto Page Street, which is, during COVID-19, a slow street. What that means is only bicycles and pedestrians, except for people who actually live here. The challenge about being young and gay is you just don't know how to get married. Back in 1987, there was no legal way. We didn't know any gay people who were our age who were together, who were actually married. But that's what we wanted. So without a ceremony, without rings, without an engagement, without a wedding, we couldn't have any of that, not legally. We just moved in together. We didn't have any role models. Fortunately, we had a wonderful person in our life, Michael's mother, Cecil. She took us seriously from the very beginning. That gave me a lot of strength. She always treated me like Michael's husband, not like his partner or somebody he just lived with. She always treated me like the man he was married to. She brought us our only wedding presents, a cutting board and a sofa with a convertible sofa in it. She really gave us legitimacy where governments and other people would not. Let's look across the street here. This is the Whitney Young Child Development Center. It's delightful to be walking on Page Street and hear the children playing in the playground right here. Unfortunately, this part of San Francisco was not always a happy place for children. Right down here at the end of the block is a 43 bus stop at the corner of Masonic and Oak. It was there that Kevin Collins, 10 years old, in 1984 disappeared. It was the last time he was ever seen. He was 10, he'd been to a basketball practice. 
Normally, his older brother took him to the basketball practice and picked him up, but his older brother was sick, so Kevin Collins had to head home to his family on Sutter Street alone. He was last seen on this corner, talking to a man named Don Leonard Theron. It turned out later that Don Leonard Theron was a convicted child molester. He'd served six months for abducting a child from Fisherman's Wharf and molesting him. He was the last person seen talking to Kevin Collins. He was never found guilty of a crime. Don Leonard Theron died in 2008. The San Francisco Sheriff's Department took a search warrant up the block to his former home in the 1100 block of Masonic. They searched the entire building, even the basement. They dug in the dirt of the basement, and in that dirt, they found bones. The bones were sent to forensics, but it was determined that they were not human bones. They were animal bones. And so the mystery of Kevin Collins has never been solved. He was the first child to appear on the side of a milk carton, asking if anybody had seen him. And it raised awareness of the plight of small children and the danger of them being abducted and molested. Kevin Collins was never heard from again. And the mystery remains of one of the most heinous crimes, which had a good side to it, if only in that it increased awareness of the dangers to children in our society. We're now riding on Page Street, and we're approaching 1550 Page Street. This is the Hippie Temptation House. This beautiful Victorian appeared in the CBS scare documentary, Hippie Temptation. In this documentary, it was shown the dangers of becoming a hippie. Isn't that magnificent? Beautifully restored. Ronald Reagan also hated hippies. So for years in the front yard here, there was a big finger pointed towards the sky. It was a finger dedicated to Governor Reagan. It was a big F U to Ronald. The Hippie Temptation House. In 1965, there was a man living here, a young man named Brown. He was a member of the San Francisco Mime Troop. His younger brother was Jackson, Jackson Brown. And he came here and lived with his brother for the summer. Jackson Brown composed one of my favorite songs, Running on Empty. I'd like to think that that song is a reference to his coming north from Southern California to visit his brother in this house. In 65, I was 17, running up 101. I don't know where I'm running now. I'm just running on, running on empty, running on empty. I love the music of Jackson Brown. Even back when I was Squaresville, I loved it. Unfortunately, in the 80s, Michael and I kind of soured on Jackson Brown because there was a rumor floating about that he had beaten up his girlfriend, Daryl Hannah. We thought that's awful, but it was never proved. It remains a rumor. He's only been condemned in the court of public opinion. I don't know if we'll ever know. This is Hate Street, which has suffered gravely during during COVID-19. You can see the businesses shut down. Until the tourists return, a lot of stores and businesses are struggling. Hopefully, this will pass. We're now headed up Ashbury Street to 635 Ashbury. 635 Ashbury was one of the homes of Janice Joplin. The first time we headed out on our bikes, we showed you her second apartment. Yes, over on Lyon Street. But this was her first. Janis Joplin came here from Port Arthur, Texas in 1963. She started recording music and she's doing pretty well. But then her roommates convinced her that she should return to Port Arthur 
because, well, she had become a methamphetamine addict. She returned to Port Arthur and started studying anthropology at a local college. She was doing pretty well, but people encouraged her to come back to San Francisco. She was scared because she knew that in order to further her music career, she would have to return to San Francisco. She also knew that when she got here, she'd probably go back on drugs. She returned to San Francisco, lived in the second apartment, the one we saw last time. And after the Monterey Pop Festival, she was incredibly popular. She had achieved fame. She also went back on drugs. She died at 27 years old of a heroin overdose. As I've said before, I never liked her music until I watched her on YouTube. And I thought, my God, what a great live performer. That convinced me of Janis Joplin. Our next stop is 715 Ashbury Street. 715 Ashbury is famous because it is the Haight-Ashbury home of the Hells Angels. This is where they lived in the late 60s. How about that? It is gorgeous Victorian. Now, the Hells Angels were famous for their outlawishness, the Harley Davidson motorcycles, their leather. They're looking for a job. They got a job from their neighbors across the street, the Grateful Dead, who lived in this house. The Grateful Dead hired the Hells Angels to be their bodyguards. There was a huge concert back east, a festival called Woodstock. I'm sure you've heard of it. Somebody decided that there should be a West Coast Woodstock. The lead band would be the Rolling Stones. They asked the Grateful Dead for a recommendation for somebody to be their security force. The concert would be held at Altamont in Livermore at the racetrack. The Grateful Dead recommended the Hells Angels. Well, Altamont has been called the end of the 60s. In December 1969, people gathered in their thousands to see the concert. There was violence. The Rolling Stones arrived on a helicopter. As Mick Jagger stepped off the helicopter, one of the crowd punched him in the head. The crowd was unruly. The concert started. The crowd surged forward. They were pushed back by the Hells Angels. They surged forward again, and a young man, Meredith Hunter, pulled out a gun. One of the Hells Angels drew a knife and stabbed him five times, dead. At the trial for murder, documentary footage was shown. It was from a film that was being made of the Altamont concert by the Maisel Brothers, who would become famous later for their wonderful film, Grey Gardens. The documentary footage revealed that in fact, Meredith Hunter was holding a gun. The Hells Angels were acquitted. The song Mick Jagger was singing at the time of the attack, was under my thumb. Under my thumb, the girl who once had me down. Under my thumb, the girl who once pushed me around. Let's stop here for a second and look at this incredible building. I love this. This is a school, the Lycée Française. How about that? Isn't that magical? I just love it. Look at the detailing. It's like a Gothic palace, a little Gothic hill town right here in the middle of the Haight. It's a whole series of buildings that stretch up the hill. So interesting. We'll see more of it in a minute. Altamont in December 1969 has generally been accepted as the end of the 60s. Not just of the decade, obviously, but of the summer of love. The love had turned to violence. The drugs were fueling hate. And so the 60s passed. It started here and spread around the world and ended at Ultimate. This is my favorite building of this complex. This is the chapel. I just adore these buildings. They're so cute. Look at that. And I love the phrase on the facade there. 
Venite adoremus. Come, let us adore him. It stretches on down the hill. All these buildings. A beautiful Gothic hill town in the middle of the Haight Ashbury. But this was not built for the Lycée Francaise. The Lycée Francaise bought it from St. Agnes School. St. Agnes School is where Kevin Collins was practicing his basketball on the night in 1984 when he disappeared. He left from the school, walked down to Masonic and Oak, and disappeared forever. The last person seen talking to him, Dan Leonard Fearon. We're now on Frederick. This is an amazing collection of buildings. Suddenly, the houses disappear and huge apartment buildings take over. I can't get over the scale of these buildings. They're gigantic. Let's just look at them. Begin with the crossways right here. Look at this, this giant classical structure. Look at that cornice. It's just amazing. And across the street, a half timbered Tudor style apartment building. And then right next to it, A.H. Larson's local masterpiece, 130 Frederick. I just adore this big pink building. How gay is that? A big pink building in the Haight Ashbury. And look at the windows. Aren't those incredible? They're majestic. They're like a New York loft. Imagine the views from those windows. We're now headed to 32 Del Mar. 32 Del Mar is known as the Sex Pistols Party House. The Sex Pistols came here and played a concert at Winterland Ballroom. After the concert, they came up to Del Mar for a party. Lead singer Sid Vicious, who was only 20 years old, was at the party and he overdosed. He didn't die though. After the party, the band broke up. Winterland was their last concert together. Sid Vicious continued to tour and he would eventually die a year later at just 21 years old in Greenwich Village, New York City. And they were here for the last time together at 32 Del Mar, the Sex Pistols Party House. Let's take a look at it. Now, I was never a big fan of Sid Vicious and the Sex Pistols. I mean, I love the name. I thought the name was hysterical. The Sex Pistols? I thought that was cute as anything. Where did that come from? And I laughed about that when I was in high school, but never really liked their music. But like I always say, if you don't like a band's music or a singer's music, check them out on YouTube. Oh my goodness. I definitely recommend Sid Vicious on YouTube. Boy, does he have stage presence. I love live performance and he's got energy. Just incredible. My favorite song of his is a cover of one of my favorite songs ever, Frank Sinatra's My Way. It's Sid Vicious covering Frank Sinatra's My Way. Now, the way Sid Vicious sings it, the first part, he sings like a dumb Brooklyn boy, like his idea of Frank Sinatra. But then the second part of the song is classic Sid Vicious Cockney Thrash. So here is my cover of Sid Vicious covering Frank Sinatra singing My Way. And no. The end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll make it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every byway. But more, much more than this, I did it my way. Regrets, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. We're now coming up on 1480 Waller Street. This apartment building is known as the death at a hate street orgy house. 
In December 1969, Christmas Day, Aunt Jimenez wrote a letter to his sister. Aunt Jimenez had come here from a small town to experience the summer of love, the hate Ashbury. And this is where she lived at 1480 Lawler. She wrote her letter on Christmas Day, 1969, that the hate had changed. What did she mean by that? She meant that there was violence and drugs here. The next night, December 26th, she was dead, the victim of a three hour gang rape. She'd been accused by her roommates of stealing one of their boots. For punishment, six boys and three girls raped and beat her for three hours. She was killed. Obscenities were found written on her body in red lipstick. They kicked her, hit her, dragged her downstairs, and finally killed her with a blow to the temple. Four of the boys were brought to trial for murder. Their defense attorney argued that there was no evidence that these four boys were involved in actually murdering her. A bunch of policemen had been on the sidewalk because they heard the noise while it was happening, but they never went in. There were witnesses who had observed the whole thing, but they had not intervened. The attorneys further argued, and they had witnesses to testify to this, that Ann Jimenez was willing that it was a consensual act on her part. Unbelievable. The foreman of the jury in acquitting the defendants said, well, it's sick, but this is a sick group of people. Nobody was ever brought to trial and found guilty for the murder and rape of Ann Jimenez. The Associated Press pointed out that there have been 30 murders in the hate in 1969, four of them on the 1400 block of Waller. The Associated Press dubbed this block Terror Terrace. If Altamont had improved it, the murder of Aunt Jimenez did. The 60s had come to an end. Michael and I really didn't have a honeymoon. We just wandered around the Haight Ashbury looking at things. We loved to walk. We just spent time together. We really didn't know any other gay couples, not our age, so we didn't have role models. And I always felt strange around straight couples because I felt like, wow, they're official. What am I? I'm just stopping at a random building. Look how gorgeous the buildings are in the Haight-Ashbury. This is completely random. In my rehearsals, I never stopped at this one. Absolutely sumptuous. So Michael and I had our own extended honeymoon, wandering around the Haight-Ashbury, wandering all over San Francisco. We also loved to go to movies, concerts, plays, opera. We saw ballet. We just liked to adventure. We weren't into bars or nightclubs. We just wanted to be with each other. Of course, we had a lot in common. We've been to the same university. We've both grown up from Marin but also learned a lot from Michael. He developed my interest in architecture, especially modern and contemporary architecture. He really fostered an interest in modern and contemporary art. He introduced me to all kinds of music that I dismissed over the years. The Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Boz Skaggs. He never really convinced me about the Who though. Joan Armitrading, people I hadn't even heard of. It was a magical time. We just had to construct it for ourselves because really there wasn't an institution of gay marriage yet. Not that anybody knew about, it. not even us. In the 50s and 60s, there was no place for queer people to meet except in bars. Some bars were designated ladies bars or bars for men and some had a reputation as places where you could meet queer people. In that way, the bars served a purpose. This is Coal Valley, which is very shishy and expensive now. But at one point, it was just sort of a dowdy little neighborhood, always adorable, but never expensive. 
until the last 15 or 20 years. We're coming up on a bar that is famous. It was called Maud's. It is the subject of an incredible documentary, Last Call at Maud's. This here is a lesbian bar in Coal Valley. It's now called Finnegan's Wake. But in fact, it was from 1967 to 1993, Maud's. It was started by a woman named Ricky Stryker who came here from Los Angeles. She thought that women need to have a place to meet, a place of their own. But this is from an era where gay and lesbian bars popped up all over the place, not just in the Castro or the Mission, but in little neighborhoods like this. This was one of those bars. Ricky Stryker was an incredible person and the foundation of the lesbian community in San Francisco. She opened up another bar in the Mission called Amelia's. She was one of the founders of the Gay Games in the 1980s. And she is the centerpiece of this wonderful documentary, Last Call at Mods, which was filmed in the last days of Mods before it shut down in 1993. Ricky Stryker died in 1994 of cancer, just a year after this wonderful bar shot. And if memory serves, I don't think there were windows, or if there were, they were covered up, a hallmark of early queer bars. It's funny, right across the street was, and I remember this, an old garage. But now, just as the bar has turned into Finnegan's Wake, the garage is no longer a garage, it's a gym. Or to be precise, a sports performance facility, the new Coal Valley. This is a terrific documentary, full of some incredible interviews. But my favorite subjects in the whole thing are the women Del Martin and Phyllis Lyons. Del Martin and Phyllis Lyons met in 1950. They were young women who knew they were lesbians and knew they were attracted to each other. But like Michael and me, there was really no way of coming together, not legally. So they did what we did. They just moved in together. That was the beginning of their marriage. They founded the Daughters of Belitis in San Francisco, an important lesbian political organization. They became activists for lesbians, queers, gays, LGBTQ plus people of all stripes. In 2004, they were finally married. Valentine's Day has always meant a lot to me. I think it's magical that they moved in on that day because Valentine's Day was when Michael and I became domestic partners. 1996, we went down to a civic building at the Civic Center. We wanted to be the first people there on Valentine's Day to get married, but some other couple beat us, two women. So the first two couples married on Valentine's Day, 1996, or I should say domestic partner, were a lesbian couple and a gay male couple. As I said, Phyllis and Bell were married officially in 2005 when Gavin Newsom allowed people to get married at City Hall in San Francisco. But the marriage was not ratified. It was the start of a long battle that led all the way to the Supreme Court. Del Morton died in 2008 with their marriage never being ratified. Phyllis Lyon died last year, April 2020. Finally, in 2013, the Supreme Court ruled that gay people could be married in the city, in the state, and federally. It was legal. Michael and I had been holding out. We didn't want to get married and have it taken away from us. But finally, in 2013, we realized it was time to legally tie the knot. We looked at each other. Because the next question would be, who would officiate? And we almost said at the same moment, Michael's mother, Cecil. Who better than the person who was there at the beginning, showing her support, buying us a cutting board, buying us a convertible bed that was also a sofa, always loving us and always accepting me as Michael's husband. She officiated in our ceremony in July of 2013 
on a little hillside in Marin County, where we've both grown up. I now want to show you my favorite house in San Francisco. It is 1401-1403 Schrader Street, built by Ira Perlander in 1980. Now, the guidebook, which is the architectural guide in Northern California, calls this Streamline Modern. I'm like, what? That's not Streamline Modern. It's classic Como, postmodern. I love it. Look at that great bay. Look at that round window up there, right out of Jacques Tati's Mononcle. And here's the thing that everybody loves most about this house, the staircase, the interior exterior staircase. It looks like it's outside, but it's actually inside glassed in. If you look closely, you'll see Iris collection of classical pieces. That's Pomo, the classical in the context of the modern, the past in the context of the present. Magical. This is a wondrous house. You can't see it from here, but Ira Kurlander's shower has a view of the Golden Gate Bridge. Let's take a look. There is a classical element we can see up close. It's right out here on the sidewalk. And this is the definition of Pomo at its best. Look at that. The piece of a little ionic column, like a ruin in ancient Rome. I just love this house. The proportions, the scale, the confidence of the design. But I'll show you the Ira Curlander house that I want. It's right next door, right up the street. Here it is, much smaller, but absolutely delectable. Isn't that special? Look at it. Now, what I love about this, and this is so Pomo, is that it takes something like a brass downspout. You see that? which is supposed to drain water from the roof, and it turns it into a decorative element. Something that's practical is made decorative and foregrounded. Usually a brass downspout would be hidden, but not in Pomo. Also, you see the classic I-beams forming an arch. This is a magical little house. Maybe one day, Michael and I will buy it. I don't know. I think it'd be a terrific place to live, and we wouldn't have to leave our neighborhood. So let's head down the hill to our next attraction. But before we do, let's pause for a second and look across the valley to a place we visited a few weeks ago, Lone Mountain. Look at it off in the distance there, like an Italian hill town. St. Ignatius soaring up into the night and the Lone Mountain College behind it forming a terrific Renaissance ensemble. Isn't that delightful? An Italian hill town in the middle of San Francisco. We're gonna head down to our next attraction. Now, I didn't just enjoy the music of other people while I lived in the hate. During the aughts and the 1990s, I uh, created a couple of musicals of my own. And I worked with a wonderful composer lyricist who composed all the music for them and wrote some terrific lyrics. One show we worked on together was Bodicea, Warrior Queen of the Britons, a celebration of that great female warrior who took on the Roman army and tried to throw them off in antiquity. The composer lyricist's name is James Dudek. And I always loved his music and thought his lyrics were just terrific. When I think about how lucky I was to find Michael in college, I also think about what life would have been for me as a gay man if I hadn't found it. I think I would have been going to bars, looking for love there. And that sounds very sad to me. I don't think I would have been very successful. It actually kind of scares me. And I think that one of James Dudek's songs from Bodicea captures what that experience might have been and what it might be for a lot of people. The song is called Misery. When your fate and your mate don't equate misery and the gods 
are at odds and time plods. Misery, when the night creeps to the dawn, you can't sleep, it goes on, you go on. When the best offer you've got is something that you'd rather not. Misery, misery. We're now headed to one of the masterpieces of Willis Polk. Willis Polk didn't like Victorian architecture. He thought it was all a ripoff of European models. He wasn't interested in the European way of doing things. He wanted there to be an indigenous San Francisco architecture. So at the beginning of the 20th century, he started to create it. Here's what he didn't like. Look at this building right here. Classical elements, the giant order columns, the heavy cornice, the bays. He thought this was all a knockoff of Europe. People love Victorians now, but he didn't. He wanted to create something simple, something that spoke to San Francisco's energy, its dynamism. He created Kizar Stadium in 1924. Now, when we were first living in the hate, Kizar Stadium was still there. And it soared up into the heavens like a Roman Colosseum. It was like being in Rome and having your own Colosseum. It was so stately. It was finished in 1924. And from 1946 until 1972, it was the home of professional football teams, the San Francisco 49ers and the Oakland Raiders. Amazing. It also played host to rock concerts, to car races, motorcycle races. Movies were shot there. There's scenes in Dirty Harry shot there. It was magnificent, majestic, big. Hey, Joe, can you show us the outside picture of Kizar Stadium? Let's take a look at the outside of this building. There it is. My goodness, in the middle of the Haight Ashbury. How they fit it in there. Joe, can you show us the interior? Just imagine Kizar Stadium packed with people. Look at that. How exciting is that? It's like a day in the Roman Colosseum with the lions stalking the Christians. Absolutely amazing. It was right here in the middle of San Francisco. Thanks, Joe. Well, it was still here, although kind of decommissioned when we lived here. But we'd walk around it, and I was always so impressed by it. Of course, when it was built, this was sort of an outside neighborhood, but then it became a quiet neighborhood with all the noise and cars, people didn't want it anymore. And when the teams moved to bigger stadiums on the edge of town, it had seen its day. It was eventually torn down, replaced with another stadium. But it did go down in history as the location of probably the most famous play in NFL history. The play is called The Wrong Way Run. In 1964, the Minnesota Vikings came to San Francisco to play the San Francisco 49ers. One of their players was Jim Marshall. He got the ball in a fumble and ran 66 yards to score a touchdown for the Vikings. He spiked the ball, he was so excited, and then threw it into the crowd. Unfortunately, he'd run the wrong way. So in fact, he'd scored a touchdown for the 49ers. His coach went up to him and said, Jim, that was a very interesting play. Well, as it turned out, it didn't count as points for the 49ers. The ball was given to them, but they didn't win the game. The Minnesota Vikings still won. They won the game. Nevertheless, it went down in history as the most famous play ever, the wrong way run right here at Kizar Stadium. Now what is left is Willis Polk's gymnasium, which you can see across the way here. Still used as a gym, but 
the stadium is gone, replaced by a below grade playing field. They did put in this rather nice postmodern hall of columns. That is kind of nice. And here we are approaching the stadium. This is what it is now. It's just a playing field with some bleachers. No walls soaring up into the heavens. Hardly a coliseum. But there is one feature I love about it. If you look across the grass, you'll see a triumphal arch. Isn't that special? That was actually the entrance to the old stadium. Old stadium was torn down. They put up this triumphal arch as a remembrance of the old Kizar Stadium. What I love about it now is it's freestanding. It's like what you see in Rome, the Arch of Constantine, or the Arch of Titus. It still makes me feel like I'm in ancient Rome, even though we've lost that majestic stadium. But fortunately, there's no inscription on it. Like I wish it talked about Julius Caesar's great victories for San Francisco. Of course, he never really achieved anything for San Francisco because uh, there was no San Francisco when Julius Caesar was around. Well, there's also no Julius Caesar around when San Francisco's around. So uh, never the twain shall meet, I guess. We're now headed down Frederick, which has come way down and almost flattened out from those huge apartment buildings we viewed here. Right. In front of me are two enormous gymnasiums. Actually, a better word is gymnasia. That's a nice plural word, Latin. Sounds better than gymnasiums. These are incredible. They're both from 1934, and they're the women's and men's gymnasiums from gymnasia, from the San Francisco Polytech High School. Isn't that great? Look at that, soaring up into the heavens. An Art Deco terracotta masterpiece. I just love it. Colored terracotta and beautifully lit at night. There's another one down the way. You see where those lights are. This one that we just looked at is a gymnasium still. The one down the way is the home of the San Francisco Circus School. In between these two gymnasia was the San Francisco Polytech High School, which has since been replaced by a housing development built in 1990, apartments and single family homes. We're gonna cross the street and move through the apartment complex to get to the next street up, Parnassus. Now, when you have a ship and it's on a river and the river doesn't intersect with another river, but you have to get to the other river, you do what's called portaging. You carry your ship overland, usually over a hill. So that's what we'll do. We'll portage my bike. We're now moving up Mount Sutro. Yes, we are on Mount Sutro. Mount Sutro is named after Adolf Sutro. He came here to this country in 1848. Let's pause here a second and look at this palatial entrance to this gymnasium. I just love this. Look at that. Isn't that great? It looks like you're entering a palace, not a gymnasium. How is that for glorified body culture? Adolf Sutro was born in 1830 in Aachen, Germany. Okay, we're moving to a child's playground. Sand, this is like Lawrence of Arabia, a true portage. He was born in Aachen, Germany. In 1848, all over Europe, there were revolutions, socialist revolutions. They all failed. His family left Europe in 1848, fleeing oppression. They came to the United States and Adolf Sutro made his fortune in the Comstock Lode. He wasn't a miner, he was an engineer and he facilitated with tunnels and water, the mining of the Comstock Loaders. He became rich, moved to San Francisco, started developing property, Eventually, he would build the Sutro Baths out near Seal Rock and his own Sutro Castle looming above the Baths. You can still see the property and the foundations 
of the baths and the castle. In the 1890s, he became mayor of San Francisco. In 1898, he donated 13 acres of Mount Sutro, his own mountain, to the University of California, San Francisco, medical school and hospital. And that was the genesis of UCSF. Now is 107 acres of this mountain. We've reached Parnassus. I love this. Parnassus is named after the mountain. This used to be called Mount Parnassus. I wish it still was. That's great. The mountain of the gods. It's always nice to think the gods are looking out over San Francisco. Behind me, closer to where I live, is Mount Olympus, another Greek god hangout. I just love these names. We're coming up in our first building of UCSF, and it is one of my favorites. I think like everybody who loves New York, one of my all time hot, hot, hot buildings in New York City is Frank Lloyd Wright's 1959 Guggenheim Museum. Well, this building is a parking garage, but it pays tribute to Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpiece. Look at this, a parking garage that swirls. Isn't that fun? I just love it. A tribute to the Guggenheim. It just swirls round and round and round. I just think that's delightful. It was built in 1972 by the architecture firm of Reed and Tarix. How clever were these guys? But their cleverness doesn't stop here because this parking garage is huge. It goes on and on and on. And it's not just a tribute to Frank Lloyd Wright and the Guggenheim. It becomes a tribute to several other architects. It's almost a history of modern architecture expressed in a parking structure. Here in front of us, we see another wing of the parking structure. This references Melnikov's house in Moscow. Look at that. Isn't that charming? So let's look at the whole thing. We're looking back now to the Guggenheim reference. Now we're moving through the main body of the parking garage. And this is all a reference to Paul Rudolph's parking garages in New Haven. And we finally get to the tribute to Melnikov's house in Moscow. Isn't that great? And all of it surmounted by a giant pagoda. Yes, they built a pagoda out of concrete and steel. I just love it. The history of modern architecture surmounted by a Japanese pagoda. How much fun is that? I love the firm of Reed and Tarix. The great thing about parking structures is they just have to house cars. They don't have to house people. So you don't have to worry about windows. In preparing for this piece, I listened to The Spark, which is UCSF's podcast. There's an incredible episode with Dr. Seema Gandhi, who is an associate professor of clinical medicine here at UCSF. Dr. Gandhi grew up in a developing country, India. She said that her parents were very careful about how they use things because in India, there's very little waste because there's very little to waste. Economy is the key to life in India. When she became a doctor, she went to London to practice and she was incredibly impressed in London with socialized medicine. Everybody, regardless of what they do, is entitled to healthcare coverage. And she said the coverage, the treatment is excellent. She was also impressed with how economical everything is, how careful they are about wastage. They don't waste equipment. They don't waste tests. The doctors don't zip about to conferences. The carbon footprint is very low. She then came to the University of California, San Francisco, and was amazed at the amount of waste. Now, as we all know, America's carbon footprint is phenomenal. It's huge. What I didn't know was that 10% of it is a result 
of the American medical industry. 10% of our enormous carbon footprint is a direct result of wastage in the American medical industry. Dr. Gandhi gives some examples. She was observing an operation. The operating theaters are very, very cold and very well lit. So the HVAC is always blasting and the lights are always bright. Of necessity, people need to see things in the cold. Well, that's what's necessary. So she's all bundled up. The operation she was observing was the only one going on in that wing of the hospital. But every other operating room in the hospital was fully lit with the HVAC blasting, just in case. She was amazed at the waste. She also talked about professors in the United States zipping about to conferences, always on the move, and how that too contributes to enormous amount of fossil fuel waste, always the carbon footprint. She encouraged her students to always be mindful of wasting equipment, throwing out things that were just opened but never used, too many tests that aren't always necessary. She said that in the United States, spending money is equated with good medicine. And she said that's not the case, not as proven by the example of Great Britain. I'd like to add to this that there is also an emotional and creative damage that is wrought. I'll talk more about that later. We're now on the UCSF campus and looking at the oldest building on campus, the hospital by Lewis Parsons Hobart from 1917-1918. Good news is this old hospital is not being torn down. It's being restored and improved. It's being modernized. So if we look, we can see that there is scaffolding as they modernize the building. Also, we begin to see the way different architects deal with the challenges of building on a mountain. This architect, even back in 1917, Hobart, chose to go vertical, but that's not the only solution. In front of us is the dental center. Let's go take a look at it. This is from 1980, John Funk Architects, and it is an exquisite example of the international style or the Bauhaus style. From 1930s, the Corbusier was of course its great proponent. And here we have another approach to building on a mountain. We have the international style approach. And John Funk, instead of deciding to build vertically, is building horizontally. His wonderful hospital marches down the building. Look at that. It actually marches down the mountain and thus hides its bulk. I just love it. It's a classic international style building. The white walls, the banded windows, it's light, it's boxy, and in this case, such a magical solution to the problem of building on a hill. Go with the hill, mirror the hill, and in the process, mask the bulk of this huge building, as opposed to Hobart, who just built vertically. I adore this building. Buildings like this convinced me that modernism, the international style, was really quite wonderful. Before that, I just like Renaissance buildings, you know, like palaces and churches and things. But when you see the thought that goes into this kind of construction, it's just wonderful. So let's go back and look at the Hobart building. So something interesting happened last year, because as I said, the regents of the University of California, San Francisco, had decided to restore this building. Inside is Toland Hall. Toland Hall has some incredible murals in them. They're in fact frescoes, paint right into wet plaster. It is a mural cycle. The mural cycle 
tells the history of medicine in California by the great muralist Bernard Sakhain. Last year, the Regents of California, the University of California, San Francisco, wrote a letter to the ancestors of Bernard Sakhain. They said that they were going to tear out the frescoes. But if the family wanted them, they had 90 days to remove them. The family was outraged. You're going to destroy these masterpieces? And they truly are masterpieces. One day, Michael and I snuck into this building. We're really good at that. We get into everything. We snuck inside to Toland Hall and looked at the frescoes. They're terrific. Sackheim was the man who organized the painting of the WPA mur murals, the painting of the WPA murals in Coit Tower. And his mural cycle inside this building is every bit as wonderful. The Sackheim family was outraged. You're going to destroy these incredible objects? The regents replied, well, we can't remove them and store them. It would cost too much money. We did a cost analysis, and it cost us $8 million. You got 90 days to get rid of them. Get them out of here, or we'll destroy them. Let's pause for a second and take a look at this. Here's my favorite Bay Area sculptor, another refugee from Europe. His name is Benjamin Bufano, and here is one of his bears. Bufano believes in two things, animals and peace. I just love his sculptures. Bernard Zottheim fled Europe also, came to the United States from Poland. He was a master sculptor. And here, just last year, his masterpiece was going to be destroyed. Can you imagine? Listen, I bet there have been a lot of popes in Rome who hated the Sistine Chapel. But did any of them write a letter to the family of Michelangelo and say, get these ugly frescoes out of here or we'll destroy them. You've got 90 days. It's absurd. And you say, John, Sakhan is not Michelangelo. Well, how do we know? He might be Michelangelo one day. Who are we to say? And I love his frescoes. And they're San Francisco specific. They're better than Michelangelo. Come on, this is our Sistine Chapel. Well, the Zakheims motivated the Bay Area Arts and Arts Conservation Community. And there was a hue and a cry raised against the university. Finally, the university relented. They said, oh, we can save them. We crunched the numbers and it's not gonna cost $8 million. It's only gonna cost 3.2. Don't worry, we're gonna take them out and put them in storage. How do you explain this? Well, one thing I've noticed about the murals is there's a lot of socialist aspects to them. Joe, can we see an example of the mural? Now, Zackheim was a socialist. He believed in social justice. In the Depression, he wanted to help people. So he put those things into his mural. I don't think the richy rich regents of the University of California liked that aspect of this mural cycle. Isn't that magnificent? I love it. Thank you, Joe. So they decided to tear it out. You know, this did happen. In Rockefeller Center, Diego Rivera created a wonderful socialist mural and it was destroyed because the Richie Riches didn't like it. It's incredible. That almost happened last year. It was narrowly avoided. Can you imagine if the Zockheims didn't motivate people? The university would have destroyed it. Philistines. We're coming up with another statue by Benjamin Bufano. I just love this one. A mother bear and her two cats. Isn't that lovely? Zockheim's family that stayed in Poland was killed during the Holocaust. I think it would have been a desecration indeed if his masterpiece had been destroyed by the regents. Incredible. When I was 24 years old, I came up here for the first time. I've been living with Michael for a year. I had a job with the San Francisco Unified School District. 
working as a substitute daycare supervisor. Now, it was a lovely job. I loved working with kids. They're so much fun. But little kids are always sick. Sometimes they don't even look sick, but they're sick. And I was getting colds all the time. And then all of a sudden, I was breaking out. I had zits all over my head, my face, my neck, my arms, all over my body. I had pustules. They didn't hurt, but it was gross. It's like, did some little kid give me adolescence? Did I catch pubescence from a child? I was 24 years old and I looked like a 13 year old. I thought, my God, I went through this already. This is worse. I can't believe it. So I came up here to the hospital. I still had insurance from my dad. They checked me out. It only took about 10 minutes and they said, you have chicken pox. Chicken pox? I thought that's something little kids get. Well, adults get it too if they didn't have it. Did you have chicken pox as a kid? I don't remember. I was just a kid. They said, well, I guess not because you've got it now. I'd gotten chicken pox from children. I decided that was it. I couldn't keep working with kids. They're too sick. They're too contagious. Also, there's something about daycare centers and schools. They're not very gay. If people are gay, they certainly don't talk about it. You know, being a sexual suspect and all that. People judge you in situations when you work with children. So I never was around gay people, at least not openly gay ones. I decided I need to get into a different industry, something gayer. Fortunately, I've spent my entire working life in the theater. We're now up on top of that pagoda structure. You see, look down there. You can see the curving Guggenheim parking structure. You see it there? Curving down. We're now up on top of the pagoda. This gives us a spectacular view of the city. I worked at the library here at UCSF briefly. I talked about that in my piece, Broke and Out of Work. This is the same view that I had. If you look off into the distance, you see downtown San Francisco. Isn't that incredible? There's the Salesforce Tower in the skyline of San Francisco. Then pan to the left, and there's our Italian hill town, St. Ignatius and Lone Mountain College. Go a little farther, look close, and you'll see the Golden Gate Bridge. How about that for a view? And then go a little farther, and you'll see the new Ferris wheel, and behind it, the De Young Museum. I love the De Young. Built in 2005 by the star architect firm of Herzog and de Meuron. It looks like a big rusting aircraft carrier that got beached. It is magnificent. What a beautiful work of contemporary architecture. It is such a witty building. Now everybody's very excited about the new Ferris wheel. For only $30, you can soar to the top of Golden Gate Park. What an incredible view you get. For only 30 bucks, I say to them, fooey, go over to the Young Museum. You can go to the top of that tower for free. And the view is exactly the same. How about that for a skyline? So I mentioned the emotional and creative price exacted on our society by the healthcare industry. What I meant was, in, I think the high cost of insurance is partly related to the wastage that Dr. Gandhi talked about in the healthcare industry. And the emotional creative loss comes from young artists. All artists need insurance and very few artists can get insurance working in their profession. As a result, most of them work full-time jobs during the day to make enough money to live in San Francisco, but also to get nice insurance. Working a nine hour day leaves you only about two or three hours at night to be creative. I work with artists putting on plays. I tell you, after a nine hour day at a demanding job, they have only so much creativity left. And a big reason they take these demanding jobs and work these long days is to have good health insurance. 
And the cost of insurance is so enormous, partially, I think, because of the wastage. Not only is this a carbon footprint disaster, but it's also wasting resources and costing too much money. Artists are never gonna be able to create properly in this country until they have insurance. And that insurance should be provided by the government. Only then will the United States be like ancient Rome or Renaissance Italy with the artists freed up to have time to create. We're now going up to see the Dolby Regenerative Medicine Building. We talked about different solutions to building on a hill. Many people have gone vertical. We've seen a lot of vertical buildings, the hospital, the pagoda structure. That's one solution to building on a mountain. Another solution, as we saw with the dental clinics, is going horizontal. When the Dolby Regenerative Medicine Building was built in 2011, the architect, Rafael Vignoli, decided to go horizontal. Not only that, he chose to build his building like a snake following the contours of the mountain. Here then is his Dolby Regenerative Medicine Building, a fantastic snaking structure wrapping around the contours of Mount Sutro. Look at that. It actually bends with the mountain. Isn't that incredible? Wrapping around the mountain. And it doesn't hide its structure. You can see the stilts right there. The construction is all visible and becomes part of the decoration. This is an amazing building, a snake like object. It's biblical, it's so impressive. Look at that. It's connected to the next building by a bridge. Its first floor is the ninth floor of the next building down the hill. I just love it. Let's go up higher and get another view of it. The first time Michael and I saw this, we knew nothing about it. We didn't know that Rafael Vignoli, an architect we'd read about, was actually building a building in San Francisco. We were in Golden Gate Park, and we looked up towards UCSF, and there was a huge silver snake wrapping itself around the mountain. We thought, my God, what is that? We came up here and discovered this terrific building. Why is it such a secret? Well, this is a stem cell research facility. It's a security building. Security, why is it so special? Well, obviously when you're doing research, you don't want people to know about it, but also stem cell research is controversial in this country. And therefore a building like this can be the target of domestic terrorism. Therefore, there is no obvious front door. In fact, there's no easy way to get in this building. It has a hidden front door. So here we are on the side of the stem cell research facility. I just love this. Look at it, wraps around the building. It still has a lot of modernist aspects, the banded windows, but it actually curves. What an elegant structure. Let's go up higher and we'll see more of the snake. Now Vignoli had to accomplish other things as well. Research now is not a bunch of hoity-toity professors sitting in their offices having thoughts. Research now is about collaboration, cross-pollination, inspiration. So a facility like this is built with a lot of lovely areas for people to bump into each other. Gardens with views, cafeterias, seating areas where people can step out of their various labs and maybe bump into another researcher who inspire them to think a different way. Look at that. The snake 
wraps down the, the hillside, following the shape of Mount Sutro. I just love it. If we step out here and look up above, guess what? There are the majestic eucalyptus trees of Mount Sutro. Adolf Sutro was obsessed with the eucalyptus tree. He just loved it. Now, the eucalyptus tree came to the city mistakenly because people thought it would make good firewood. Well, it turns out it doesn't. It explodes in the fire. It doesn't burn properly. But Sutro didn't like it for that. He liked it because he just thought it was a wonderful tree. So he planted his Mount Sutro with thousands of eucalyptus trees. We're coming down the mountain. We're gonna look at another building, which really impresses me. It's by the same architects who created the Guggenheim parking structure, Reed and Tarix. It's from 1961. It's the Health Sciences Building. And it's right next to Vignoli's building. Now, this is such an interesting structure. And we'll stop and look at it for a second. Because it has all these great columns on it. I've never seen so many columns on a building. Look at that. Isn't that majestic? It's a feast of columns. Columns all over it. But those aren't columns. They're ducts, air ducts, heating ducts, HVAC ducts, everything. The internal aspects of the building are made external. What's usually buried inside the building is put on the outside to become decoration. It's like a massive Parthenon, a celebration of columns soaring up into the sky, soaring all the way up to the cornice, which isn't actually a cornice, it's a big pipe. In other words, the functional aspects of the building, which are usually hidden inside, have now become the decorative exterior. Isn't that incredible? What an idea. It's like Ira Kurlander's building with the brass downspouts becoming the decorative centerpiece. This building is a celebration of columns, but they're not columns. Their pipes. I just love it. Look at that. Have you ever seen more columns on a building? There's so many of them because they're completely functional. What an inspiration. And look at that cornice up there, a huge pipe. This is directly behind the Vignoli. And it's attached to the Vignoli by this bridge. That is a San Francisco marriage. Two buildings joined in matrimony, a contemporary masterpiece and a modernist masterpiece. Both of them absolutely different and absolutely compatible. I just adore Reed and Tarek. This is an amazing structure. The marriage on Mount Sutro. In the 1970s, a very famous building was built in Paris the Pompidou Center in the Beauborg. Its architects were the star architects Richard Rogers and Renzo Piano. The innovation of this building was all of the ducts, all of the pipes were on the outside. The interior was made exterior. I wanted to say to them, well, Reed and Tarix did that in 1961. Where'd you get that idea from? Anyway. Cross pollination. We're now headed back to Parnassus. So you say to me, give young artists insurance. Well, if you give young artists insurance, everybody on the planet is going to say they're an artist. How do they prove they're artists? Well, there must be some way of proving you're an artist. You got a BA in some sort of creative study. You prove that you work eight hours a day creating art? I don't know. Maybe another artist who's already been recognized says you're an artist. There must be some way of qualifying recognition, quantifying it. 
If we free up artists to create, I promise you, their creations will be vibrant and exciting. But not culture, it's all about insurance. And insurance costs too much. Every time somebody I know loses their job or changes jobs, I hear that dreaded word, COBRA, self-insurance. It's almost impossible. You can't pay for your own insurance. And to get it from a fancy company, you have to work long, hard hours, leaving very little energy left for creativity. Let's stop here at 318 Parnassus. The man who wrote the book on the Hells Angels is Hunter S. Thompson. And this is where he lived in the late 60s when he was creating his book. He lived here with his family. I love this oval window with the keystones. Isn't that cute? Hunter S. Thompson was a gonzo journalist, self-described. Gonzo journalism was part of the new journalism. It wasn't objective, it was subjective. The journalists entered into the lives of their subjects. They became one of them. This is best characterized in the writing of Tom Wolfe and George Plimpton. The writing is hip, it's punchy, it's fun. And as I say, it's subjective. That is Hunter S. Thompson's characterization of the Hells Angels. He's a subject in the book. He idolized the Hells Angels. He loved their lawlessness. He loved the leather. He loved the toughness. He loved that they were so crazy. But he did tell them, if you're going to be crazy, you should be paid for it. Otherwise, you're going to end up in jail. That was his solution. Write books and be a journalist. Get paid for being crazy. Unfortunately, he suffered his disillusion with the Hells Angels. One day, he was witness to an angel beating his wife. He shouted, only a punk beats his wife or his dog. And then the Hells Angels turned on him and they beat him up. Hells Angels was his first book. He'd go on to write Fear and Loathing and many other gonzo journalist books. But it all started right here in the hate on Parnassus with his coverage of the early Hells Angels movement. We're now going to turn up to Willard Street and look at a house right here, 1403 Willard, with its soaring pinnacles up into the sky. Look at that, soaring up into the night, into the trees. I just love this building. It's from 1900. And here again, it's got a great oval window with the keystones, except that they're so exaggerated. It's almost postmodern, all the way back in 1900. The next stop is an apartment building designed by a man called Charles Paff. Now, what's unique about this apartment building from 1905 is the shingle work. I just love it. Let's see if we can see a detail here. Now look at these shingles. Look at that. Isn't that just charming? George Paff's shingle work. A one, four, two, three, Willard. We're now going to Portage again. We need to get up to Edgewood, a delightful street just above us. Instead of riding up, we're going to portage up the Farnsworth Steps. Now, along the way, we'll pass the house of Leonard Wolf. San Francisco's Leonard Wolf. Leonard Wolf is a Vulcan. No, he really is. But unlike Spock, he's a real Vulcan. He comes from Vulcan in Transylvania, Romania. He's a poet and a translator and an editor. He translated the Gothic horror novels like Dracula and Frankenstein. He's perfect to translate Dracula because he's from Transylvania. He came to the United States and studied at the University of California, Berkeley. And then he became a professor at San Francisco State University. But his biggest mark was made when he formed the Happening House. 
The Happening House was an alternative university in the Haight-Ashbury, where we would train people to become hippies. And this is his house, an adorable craftsman structure on the Farnsworth steps. Look at the tiles, the windows, classic arts and crafts. Now his daughter is my age. She's Naomi Wolf. She wrote some very influential books. Here's his balcony, affording a terrific view of downtown San Francisco. Isn't that great? A building with a heart on it, if you look close enough. Naomi Wolf is a feminist. He wrote an incredible book called The Beauty Myth. The Beauty Myth talks about how women have achieved so much in the post-war era, but along with their amazing achievements, there's been a constant growth in their obsession with beauty. This has been fueled by the film and television industries with their portrayals of the ideal women, the fashion industry, and the most lucrative industry of all, the porn industry. In Emily Wolf's view, this has had a horrible effect on women. It has brought about eating disorders and an obsession with plastic surgery. In a survey conducted at the time of the writing of the beauty myth, women were asked what they wanted most, achievement, money, success in business, 30% of the women interviewed said what they wanted most was to lose 10 pounds. This is all recorded in the beauty myth. Naomi Wolf said, women have to move beyond an obsession with beauty. This is 109 Edgewood. By Peterson Ross from 1906. Look at that glorious tile work soaring up into the sky. Just up the street here is 123 Edgewood by William Knowles, also from 1906. Again, like the building we saw down at the bottom of the Farnsworth steps, it's famous for its A-frames soaring up into the night sky. Edgewood is a phenomenal collection of arts and crafts structures. The shingle work, the green, the brackets, magical up here. As we go up to Edgewood, you'll notice that the roadway is red brick. That's because originally this hilltop had red stone. So when the roads were laid out, the people who lived here wanted to be reminded of the red stone that their houses have been built on. So red brick was installed. I read a book by Naomi Wolf called Promiscuities. It was an amazing read. She talked about her own sexual history and her own sexual awakening. And she talked about how women need to seize back their sexuality. They had to get away from dichotomies like whore, virgin. They had to decide what their sexuality was and assert it with confidence. She also talked about sex education and how it focused too much in schools on intercourse and the consequences of intercourse. And that subliminally, it encouraged abstinence. Well, that wasn't gonna work because abstinence just breeds frustration. And when people get frustrated, they make mistakes. She said that sex education should emphasize sexual gradualism. You should focus on things like masturbation, mutual masturbation, and oral sex. Now, I know those are all icky subjects to talk about, but if you don't talk about them, people won't know. Or worse, they'll learn about them from other kids, which is the wrong way to learn. She was an activist for women taking control of their sexuality responsibility for their sexuality. 
and for passing on that knowledge to younger women so that things like unwanted pregnancies could be avoided and yet sexual pleasure could still be found. Here is 226 Edgewood. The architect from 1911 is Louis Mulgard. This structure was bought by Evan Williams, the founder of Twitter. He wanted to tear it down and build a huge house that filled the lot. There was a hue and a cry raised. 300 people wrote letters to the planning commission saying that this was an outrage, that a historically important structure of the great Louis Mulgart, Mulgart would be destroyed. They wanted it stopped. In fact, I think that what they were gonna miss was that lovely garden in front that you saw with the pear tree in it. And also, I don't think they were so much concerned about the house. There's very little of Louis Mulgart left. It's been added to and subtracted to so much in recent years that it really isn't Louis Mulgart anymore. I think what they were really objecting to was the size of the house and the fact that they thought it'd be a big party house and that probably what that meant was a lot of parking spaces would be lost. Parking and partying, that's what really influences the neighbors, not so much fine architecture. We've reached the, edge, the end of Edgewood. We're looking now into the forest on Mount Sutro. This is the location of a mystery, a mystery that I've never solved. I became obsessed with an indigenous person who was brought to UCSF pretty much against his will at the beginning of the 20th century. It was purported that he used to come up onto these woods because they reminded him of his home and he discovered a cave up here. I've never been able to find that cave. Michael and I have looked for it a dozen times. Somewhere in these woods is the cave. We'll talk more about this later. We're back headed down Edgewood again. We're gonna pass 240 Edgewood, designed by the architectural team of Marquis and Stoller. Now again, this masterpiece of modernism, I'm not sure how much of it is left. There might be very little. It's hard to tell, but what is here looks pretty slick. and new. Is this really the Marquis and Stoller building? Maybe, it's handsome enough. I'm just not sure it's theirs. We're now headed down Edgewood towards the former house of everybody's favorite San Francisco author, Armistead Maupin, who wrote what many people consider to be our priest, Tales of the City the ultimate extended novel about San Francisco. A gay man who wrote his book and had a husband before you could have a husband. He lived in this house with his husband, but they broke up. The pressures of the AIDS generation. The husband moved out and Armistead was very generous. He acted like it was a divorce with a settlement. He set the husband up in a condo across the valley on my mountain, Buena Vista. The husband was in the Bauman building, which is a building I visited last time. The first time we went out on the bike right near my apartment. The Bauman is that incredible building at the top of my mountain with the incredible big windows. Armistead set his ex-husband up in that building. So here is the gate to Armistead's house right there. And if you look across the valley, you'll see in the distance that light in the middle of that mountain is the Bauman with big windows. Why'd he put them there? So he could look across the valley and see what he was up to. 
This is all in Armistead Maupin's wonderful book, The Night Listener, where he actually depicts himself staring longingly across the valley to see what his ex-husband is up to with those big windows. That's why he bought them the condo there, so he could keep an eye on him. It's an amazing book. Of course, everybody loves Tales of the City, but I love The Night Listener. It's a mystery. It's suspenseful. It's full of longing and excitement. And it's all set up here on Edgewood. It's incredible. A wonderful read. If you haven't read it, I definitely recommend it. We're going to take a left turn now and go down and see two more houses up here. We're now back on Willard, except the higher spot. Oh my goodness, there it is again. Our wonderful Lone Mountain, off in the distance. Remember, we claimed that for gay. It's now a gay mountain, officially. We're now coming up on 260 Willard. This is a house from the first decade of the 20th century, the 19 aughts. And it's distinguished because it has this lovely mission style roof. You see it there? Yep. Even on a Victorian, you could pay tribute to the missions. Right next to it is a house built by a man called William Terry. And it has Tudor elements. You see the Tudor half timbering in brackets? And yet it too is a Victorian. Isn't that charming? That's 256. Willard. Now, William Terry is an architect. He's listed in the guidebooks as a carpenter. Who needs architects? Carpenters can build buildings too. Isn't that fun? When Michael and I are out hiking, we like to do loop hikes. That saves energy and means the views are nicer. But the loop has failed. It's very hard to do a loop up here because the streets are so short and they go nowhere. That's great for the residents. It means no traffic. Have you seen a single car pass us since we got up here? We're now gonna to go to 1506 Willard. Now the guidebooks love this place because it has a little quatrefoy window. A quatrefoy is like what kind of a plant? It's like a clover, right? So this kind of window is an excellent omen. Let's see if we can see it. There it is, quatrefoy. It looks like a four-leaf clover. I think it was actually a window once, but somebody's put an attic story up there and changed the attic level. Now, Hey everyone, hang tight. Looks like John lost a signal, um, but hopefully he will move into range of another signal soon and will join us again. Hang tight.
Hey, Joe. Joe? Yep, hey. welcome back. Thank you. I am out of power. Uh-oh. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay. Do you have visuals? Uh, I can see you, too, yeah. Okay. Let me see if I've got my Zoom feature. Oh, I do. Okay, so we're back. I'm just going to have to shout because I've lost power. So I don't have my headset. My power is not plugged in to my headset. So can you hear me loud and clear? I can hear you pretty well. Yeah. Okay, terrific. So I will just continue with external power and no headset. The thrills of live theater. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so you've got visual. Have you got the visual? Yes, we do. It's on okay. its side. It is on its, turned on its side. It's turned on its side. Okay, let me see if I can adjust that. Ah, oh, that's better. Whoop, no, there we go. Okay, is it, on, is it straight up now? It's straight up now, yeah. Okay, great. So let me see what I've done. All right, fine. We go on. Thank you. We're back. And are we recording? Yes, we are. And are we on Facebook Live? We're on Facebook Live. Lovely. Then we are back. I'm now headed down to Willard. I'm going to take a left turn onto Woodland. I'm going to visit a house built by one of my favorite California architects. He was born in Austria and he fought in the Austrian army during World War I. He was disgusted by World War I. His commanding officer was an ex-policeman empowered by the Austrian army to act like a sadist. He used to shell Serbian women and children, wanton destruction. He was appalled by the behavior of the Austrians during the First World War. He left Europe in the 1920s and came to California. His name is Richard Neutra. Here is a house that he built in San Francisco. Now, most of his houses were built in Southern California, but this is a little gem right here in San Francisco. I just love this. It's a modernist classic. First of all, it's built under this magnificent tree, but there are all those international style Bauhaus features that we saw at the dental school, the banded windows, the simple, airy, boxy construction. Also, there's some things specific to Neutra. The silver cornice and the silver window frames and some incredible balconies, which give a phenomenal view of downtown San Francisco, which you can just glimpse there through the trees. How about that? I just love this building. Now, there are some phenomenal Richard Neutras in Southern California, especially in the Silver Lake District of Los Angeles. But this one is special because here he used redwood siding. Isn't that lovely? And it's actually red. He didn't often paint his sightings. Look at these lovely features on the side. There's an incredible silver cornice over the garage, whereas the house itself has very little cornice, just flashing. I love these windows. Let's go around to the side here. More banding, more great views. What an incredible piece of architecture. Its neighbor is not so bad either, the Victorian with witches' peaks. And the next neighbor is a Victorian of a Southampton nature. Isn't this charming? All of these working together with a modernist masterpiece up at the top. Richard Neutra from 1936. I just love it. Now Neutra loved to work with his clients. He actually asked them, what do you want? Unlike Frank Lloyd Wright, who was an artist, in quotes, and did what he wanted, Neutra 
He wanted to make his customers happy. So we asked him what they wanted and he built it for them. The reason he's such a great artist is that only, not only did he give them what they wanted, but also all of his houses look like I'm impressed by that. Artistry that makes the clients happy. We're now coming down Woodland Avenue, headed back towards Parnassus. You know, I talk about young artists having insurance. I'm very lucky. Michael worked for the city for years. And because our city is so enlightened and we're domestic partners, he was able to give me fancy insurance. It's pretty much what's allowed me to be an artist my whole life. Because I had insurance. I could never have afforded it on my own. Or I would have had to take a job that could provide me with fancy pants insurance. So, how are we going to give everybody insurance? Be more like England. Be more like so many countries with socialized medicine. I think we could start by getting rid of some of the waste just making it cheaper. We're now down in Parnassus, heading towards Scania. Here's an interesting contrast. Here are two stores on two different corners built in the Victorians. Now, one of them is a corner grocery. Usually it has flowers, fresh fruit out front. As you see, it's been put away already. You look up at the top, and there's a charming Victorian. Then across the street is Walgreens, which has been built into a Victorian also, and still looks like Walgreens. I think they could have adapted a little bit to the Victorian aesthetic. It's the same old Walgreens with the big windows and the cursive writing. Oh, well, I'm sure everybody up here is happy to have a Walgreens. Walgreens always come in handy, don't they? We're now headed up Scanyon. It's fire station number 12. Michael and I discovered this one day in our early walks around the neighborhood. It's a magnificent mid-century modern structure from the firm of Way, Frick, and Coos. It was built in 1956. You see, all those modernism saw in the international style buildings we've stumbled across dental clinics, and the Richard Neutcher structure. It's been beautifully restored recently. There you see the banded windows, the stucco siding, and the Roman bricks. Isn't this charming? A horizontal structure, much like the dental school. One day we were walking around, and we passed this fire station. I saw a sign on the side of it. I was like, what's that? Michael, what's that sign for? Michael said, well, you know what that sign means. I said, no, I don't. He said, well, can't you tell from looking at it? I said, not really. He said, this is a safe haven. It's the same sign we looked at years ago. Safe surrender site. I said to Michael, what does that mean? He said, well, if you have a baby you don't want, you can bring it here and leave it. No questions asked. I said, well, why would you need to do that? Uh, people are sensitive about being asked too many questions. Really? Well, what would they do with the baby otherwise if they want to keep it a secret? Michael said they're putting them in dumpsters, trash cans. I said, really? He said, yeah. If they drop it off here, nobody asks any questions. And it's given to the right agency and eventually given foster care or adopted. I was amazed. I was like, wow, is that really what's going on? Babies in dumpsters? It gets me back to Naomi Wolf's book, Promiscuities, talking about sex education. The more people know, the more careful they'll be, the more options they'll have. If we just talk about intercourse and make it sound like it's so dangerous because of pregnancy, people will feel like we're promoting abstinence and they'll get frustrated and accidentally pregnant. But if there are alternatives, 
masturbation, mutual masturbation, oral sex. And I know those are icky phrases. I know. Talk about things. Making bad choices. When I was in school, nobody talked about being gay. Nobody said anything about it. Nobody talked about the dangers, the diseases. I'm just so grateful that I went out into the world and I found somebody to be gay with. Michael and I actually brought each other out of the closet. And I think of when I emerged into the homosexual world, it was the era of AIDS. And my innocence might have gotten me in a lot of trouble if I hadn't been lucky enough to find Michael. We have to talk about stuff because only then will people have knowledge. If they have knowledge, they'll be able to make at least informed decisions about sex. This is the interior green belt. In 1886, Adolf Sutro brought a bunch of children out here and they planted thousands of eucalyptus trees. We're now entering the interior green belt or the forest at Mount Sutro. I've talked a lot about the walk o' death. We've been on a few of them, but this is truly a real walk o' death. Between 1898 and 1908, there were many suicides in this area. Hey. Hey there. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. People would come here and commit suicide. Men. They'd hang themselves from these trees. This was the big suicide spot in San Francisco. It truly is a walk o' death. Alex Bell, an online writer, has encouraged people to come here and listen for the ghosts of the suicides. Walk in the darkness, as we are doing now on San Francisco's true walk o' death. Most of the suicides were men who hung themselves with these trees. One man was discovered two months after he killed himself. He'd blown his head off with a gun. His left hand, his left leg up to the knee have been consumed by animals. The despondency, the despair of people who come to San Francisco seeking dreams, become frustrated, end up alcoholics, end up in the almshouse, and then came here to end their lives. Alex Bell encourages us to listen for their ghosts. Michael and I entered these woods a dozen times looking for the cave of that indigenous person. I became so frustrated that I wrote to the author of a book about him. And I asked the author, if he could come here and show me where the cave was. He lived in North Carolina, but it turned out he was coming here to visit his father in Berkeley. He said, yes, he'd be happy to. I heard stories about this cave. I read about it. I'd even seen pictures of people inside it, but we've never been able to find it. The author came here and he, his friend and I, walked all over these woods for hours. He said, I know where it is. I've been inside it, but we never found it. It was a complete mystery. We never located this cave. I signed up for a tour with the San Francisco Public Library, which talked about this cave. It was part of the tour. The tour guide was great. He led us around Edgewood, and then he brought us up here to the woods. We stood out in the clearing and he said the cave was a myth. It doesn't exist. To this day, we don't know what the truth is 
about the cave. And soaring up above us, behind that light right there, you can see the lights flashing of Sutro Tower. Sutro Tower is a huge telecommunications tower on top of Sutro Hill. Of course, even that is controversial. There you see it, the lights in the night. A galleon, as Vikram Seth described it, sailing through the night. Now, Sutro Tower is actually not on top of Sutro Mountain, Mount Sutro. It is in Clarendon Heights, which is a prominence between Mount Sutro and Twin Peaks. It has its own little mountain. I argued about that for a couple of days with somebody and they finally convinced me. It has its own little bump. It's 970 feet tall. It was built in 1973 by Fulman Anderson. It was the tallest structure in San Francisco until 2018 when the Salesforce Tower opened at 1,070 feet. But because it's on top of Clarendon prominence, it soars 1,800 feet into the night. It is still the highest object in San Francisco. We're now headed back down the hill. During COVID-19, we've taken many hikes up into Sutro Forest. And we finally got to the top where Sutro, Adolf Sutro's son, built his own castle up at the very top of Mount Sutro. That castle has been uh, taken away, destroyed. And now it's an open space, kind of a botanical garden. We were walking around and I thought, oh my God, I think I found the, found the cave. And I started digging through foliage because I could sense that there was an entrance, that this finally was the cave I had been seeking forever. And I was gonna go inside it. But as I cleared away the foliage, I revealed only rock. To this day, we've never found this cave. That tour guide said it was a romantic myth. But I think there must be something up there. Our people are staging pictures. And I can't believe that academic in North Carolina would stage a picture of himself. Coming down from the mountain, we're basically at the top of Cole Valley. Michael and I are still together, still happy. COVID 19 has been great. It spent more time together. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to see much of Michael's mother, the wonderful Cecil, who was there at the beginning. He really was the first person for many years, the only person who kind of made us feel official married. But now we're married in every sense of the word. But then we always were. My love of the Haitians and of San Francisco comes mostly from Michael, his informed view of things about everything, but he's always inquisitive, always wanting to learn more. So here's one final view of that glorious San Ignatius on Lone Mountain. There it is in the distance, always there to guide us on. I'm going to go down to this intersection here because I want to do one last thing before we end. You know, you never had to convince me about Mick Jagger. I always loved his music. But then when I saw how he moved, I loved him even more. I didn't even see him move. I saw Tina Turner on the David Letterman show do an imitation of it. I thought, my God, is that how he moves? There's nothing better than Tina Turner doing the imitation of Mick Jagger. Great stuff. Well, I can't dance like Peter Turner or Mick Jagger, but there's some Christmas lights hanging to this tree. And I can do a little dance to conclude our evening. We can't play any music because of rights. If we play music, 
our videos get blocked. But this has been a unique adventure for me tonight. For the first time ever, I lost power. That's something new. Also, I did things without a headset. That's great. So here's my dance to the Haight-Ashbury and to our trip up Mount Sutro. And if you're wondering, that was Start Me Up by the Rolling Stones. I love that song. Hey there, I'm John Fisher, and this has been Sutro. Thank you so much for joining me. Stay COVID safe. If you'd like to make a donation to our theater to support this kind of programming, we've done over 70 of these productions during COVID-19, most of them free. We'd certainly appreciate your support. You can mail a check to me, John Fisher, at my COVID-19 office, Theater Rhinoceros, 91 Central Avenue, number 102, San Francisco, California, 94117, or you can go on our website, www.therhino.org, T-H-E-R-H-I-N-O.org, and contribute through PayPal. We just did a benefit, and that has helped us a lot, but we continue to struggle in these complicated COVID-19 times. Hopefully next season we'll be live on stage, but it's certainly been fun discovering Zoom, the challenges and the rewards of peddling around, telling stories. Thank you so much for joining me. It wouldn't be a show without you. And I've certainly enjoyed riding my bike around and performing for you tonight. I left out one thing. Sutro Tower once had fluorescent tubes on it. It was lit up in fluorescent. People hated that. People have gotten over the hate of Sutro Tower. But can you imagine how great it would be if it was all fluorescent? I think they should bring that back. And with that thought, I leave. Good night, and thanks for watching Sutra.